Well, we begin with the president's overseas trip. This is the biggest trip that he's taken, most important, uh, certainly this year. Joining me now is NBC News Chief White House Correspondent Peter Alexander in Jerusalem and Washington Post Foreign Affairs Columnist David Ignatius. Peter, on Iran, the president also discussing the potential for nuclear talks. We heard those differences in language on Iran just a few moments ago. Let's talk about that. The president emphasizing that he would take military action, as he told an Israeli journalist, uh, as a last resort, and taking a, a strong line saying that you know, we're not going to wait forever for Iran to come back to the negotiating table, but certainly disagreeing with the Israeli prime minister. They've been taking covert and kinetic you know, military action you know, for years now against Iran to slow down its nuclear program. Yeah, Andrea, that's exactly right. So these two men, the prime minister here, Yair Lapid of Israel and President Biden together, signed this joint agreement today, a declaration with a shared commitment that they would never allow Iran to acquire a nuclear weapon. But there are certainly differences in the way that they get there. As you heard from Lapid, the prime minister, Israel's desire is that there is a credible military threat, that it's only the use of force that will push Iran back from the brink of trying to develop uh, not just a nuclear weapon, but even to develop a nuclear program. And from the president, he kept open that glimmer of hope that there would be diplomacy. As you heard the president saying, that's his preferred route. He did in that interview earlier this week, saying as a last resort, the U.S. would be willing to use military force. And Lapid says there's no difference between the two, but certainly it is that difference between the U.S.'s effort to use diplomacy and also the U.S. basically setting the line at the production of a nuclear weapon, not the production or the capability to produce a nuclear weapon with the belief system that they're really only a matter of weeks or perhaps months away from advancing that nuclear uh, program. It is notable, Andrea, that it's seven years to the day since the Obama-Biden administration joined in, announced that JCPOA, that Iran nuclear deal, Donald Trump, the past president, pulled the U.S. out. The president did, as you say, say that he would not wait forever, though, for Iran to come back to the bargaining table to renegotiate a revived deal, Andrea. And there's certainly no sign that they're willing to do that right now. David Ignatius, uh, you are you know, the best expert of all on Saudi Arabia, both because of your colleague and friend, uh, Jamal Khashoggi, but also for years following their, their activities in the region. And what, how are you reading this trip right now? Amnesty International, other human rights groups bitterly opposing it. Other senators now saying, well, if we can get concessions from them on human rights. It'll, it's okay because there is a larger issue. Andrea, I, I think President Biden put it pretty, pretty succinctly today in his press conference in Israel. He said the trip to Saudi Arabia is about U.S. interests. And in saying that, he's implicitly saying that it's not about U.S. values, U.S. principles. Uh, I think on that issue, he sounded a little defensive. He talked about how he has spoken in the past about Jamal Khashoggi. Uh, takes the issue seriously, but he's going to Saudi Arabia for a different pur purpose, uh, and that is to, to uh, rebuild the U.S. Uh, security relationship, to try to get Saudi cooperation on oil production, to do things that uh, we usually refer to as rail politique, and that is the triumph of power and interests uh, over values. So th that's what this trip is going to be about. Uh, Biden, I, I think, uh, if you read carefully, is, is admitting as much. Uh, it would be extraordinary to be a fly on the wall in, the, in, the, in a private meeting where, where uh, MBS and, and Biden will first encounter each other. Will Biden tell him privately uh, how upset, angry, uh, insistent on some kind of accountability the United States is, or will he let it go? We probably won't. Uh, know about that private conversation. We'll all be watching to see whether there's a photograph, a handshake uh, between uh, President Biden and Mohammed bin Salman. Um, but uh, this, uh, again, to underline, by, as Biden says, this trip is about interests, and in that sense, it overrides our values. Well, David and Peter, let's listen to the president and some, you know, the way he framed it today at that news conference with the Israeli prime minister. I have never been quiet about talking about human rights. The question that I'm — the reason I'm going to Saudi Arabia, though, is much broader, is to promote U.S. interests. I'm going to be meeting with nine other heads of state. 
It's not just as happy as to be in Saudi Arabia. I always bring up human rights. But my position on Khashoggi has been so clear. If anyone doesn't understand it in Saudi Arabia or anywhere else, then they haven't been around for a while. He's certainly indicating that it'll be a private conversation, David, that it's not going to be a public denunciation as it was when he was talking during the campaign. So, Andrew, I, I think that the point uh, to underline is what the United States should be seeking is assurances that nothing like this could ever happen again, that Mohammed bin Salman takes seriously our insistence that Saudi Arabia has to control its security forces, that an American journalist, a Saudi journalist for that matter, outside Saudi Arabia, would never be subject to the kind of uh, a brutal operation that, that, that uh, Jamal Khashoggi, my, my colleague, was. And those assurances haven't been made. And I hope President Biden doesn't leave the kingdom without getting s some indication, some clear statement, public or private, from the Saudi leader that he's taking steps to make, su make sure that what happened won't happen again. And as well as John Brennan was telling us yesterday, is that some of the people being held and some of the children of leading figures in Saudi Arabia, uh, dissidents who are being punished, will be released. Uh, Peter, you know, finally, I know the White House traveling press has been told going into Israel that there'd be, because of COVID rules, there would be no handshakes and there'd just be fist bumps, but they couldn't control Bibi Netanyahu wanting a big handshake with the president. And they certainly can't control Joe Biden hugging Holocaust victims. So <laughs> what do we think we'll see in Saudi Arabia? <laughs> Well, Andrea, obviously, this is a hands-on president, and so it was no surprise that you would see him first bumping fists, as the White House indicated he would, as an effort to try to uh, avoid COVID, but it clearly gave them an opportunity to try to avoid a handshake, that awkward photo op with MBS in Saudi Arabia as well. But as you noted, just minutes after his arrival here, he was shaking hands, gripping hands with Bibi Netanyahu, embracing the Holocaust survivors, and even just within the last hour or so, he was holding hands for an extended period of time with Israel's President Isaac Herzog, uh, Isaac Herzog, who presented President Biden with the Presidential Medal of Honor. So if they're going to say that that's the reason why he wouldn't shake hands with uh, MBS in Saudi Arabia, I think the president has proven that he's willing to overlook that protocol. Andrea? Yeah. And uh, President Herzog from a, an illustrious family, uh, including a grandfather who was the chief you know, rabbi in, uh, in Ireland and knew... Joe Biden and Biden's parentage back then. So, I mean, this is all old home week in Israel for Joe Biden, or he'd like it to be. Thank you very much.